Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me at uh, this time. Um, in this talk, we are going to look at a little bit at the evolution of application architecture. So we'll spend some time looking into, uh, into the history. We'll look into what are the architectures today and where they're heading. You know, hopefully it will be an entertaining talk. Uh, my name is Bilgini Bram, so I'm product manager at Diagrid, where we are building uh, tools and APIs based on Dapper project. Uh, before that, I was consultant architect at Red Hat for many years, so I used uh, Red Hat middleware, I used Kubernetes, and I have a book about it. If you want to grab a free sponsored copy, you can get it from this uh, link. Uh, so let's you know, start with the monolithic uh, application era. So in the timeline I look at, this is the time obviously before microservices, this is the time before uh, cloud adoption. And if you were a developer at the time, if you were writing maybe some complex application, you might be using something like an ESB, you know, enterprise service bus. And as a developer, what I had to the time is was the right business logic. But in addition to that, I had to take care of many other things. For example, I had to take care of things around, you know, packaging of the services I write, placing those on the right nodes, uh, making sure, you know, defining how they can be uh, configured, scaled, how they should be released, etc. In addition, if you, for example, had to do uh, synchronous service calls, you had to, you would be responsible within the application layer, making sure that these interactions are secure, making sure these interactions are, you know, reliable and maybe even observable. If you would uh, have something like an asynchronous interactions messaging, you would have within your applications, you know, publishers, subscribers, message transformation, routing, protocol conversions, connectors, etc. And if you're unlucky and you also have to do uh, coordination between multiple services you would have in your application, maybe distributed transaction, you know, have something like a, a saga pattern, you know, make sure uh, various endpoints are idempotent, etc. So these are all the stateful workflow uh, requirements. And what about the infrastructure? Um, as a developer at the time, I would see the infrastructure more like a thin layer and I wouldn't have big expectations from it. You know, I would get a compute in the form of some, uh, you know, VM with certain uh, CPU and memory, maybe some networking, you know, static IP addresses and port numbers and storage and, and that's it. And what about the, you know, the boundary or the contract between the application and the infrastructure between the developers and ops? Uh, at the time, these were in the form of uh, operating system primitives. So either that would be a VM or maybe it's a VM with a Java installed or a Java with some kind of uh, application runtime and that would be the contract, right? Uh, so we could say that was a time of, you know, static, dumb infrastructure and dynamic smart uh, application layer. And this is kind of the structure I will use in this uh, talk to explore, you know, how did the application responsibility shifts, what happened with the infrastructure and the contract between those. So let's keep that in mind. Um, so while that was, you know, the state of the art before 2010, there were a few, you know, influential ideas that changed the way we design applications. So the first one is domain-driven design, a term coined by Eric Evans in his book with the same title. And basically, domain-driven design introduced a set of principles and patterns that helped developers encapsulate business logic uh, uh, into apl application and introduced ideas such as, you know, bounded context, which represents a space where all the terminology is understood ubiquitously uh, among all participants. It introduced the idea of aggregate, which is basically a collection of objects yet that you can treat uniformly from transactional point of view, etc. So basically, even though domain-driven design was created nearly a decade before microservices, it set the foundation, you know, it became the cornerstone of microservices movement later, helping developers to find the right boundaries of services. Uh, second uh, influential idea, in my mind, that's a hexagonal architecture, a term coined by Alistair Cockburn uh, in an attempt to address some of the structural pitfalls of uh, uh, three-tier applications. For example, it helps uh, uh, identify the boundaries between the different layers and uh, assign, uh, you know, right responsibilities. It helps to isolate external dependencies uh, with, a, uh, with a standardized approach called um, ports and adapters, which is another name for this term. Uh, 
Then there were a uh, few related ideas such as uh, onion architecture and clean architecture by Uncle Bob. And they all emphasized, you know, the separation of concern between the different layers within your uh, application. Um, then came microservices and 12-factor apps. So uh, microservices built on top of the idea of domain-driven design for finding the right boundaries, on top of the idea of hexagonal architecture for isolating external dependencies. It introduced principles saying that uh, services should be independently uh, deployable, re releasable, scalable uh, on its own. And 12-factor app, it introduced 12 concrete you know, rules on how to develop applications that can be scaled on cloud environments. And uh, Basically, uh, uh, this changed uh, uh, the way we are uh, doing, um, I would say, middleware. So this kind of sparked of first separation of middleware responsibilities outside of an ESB or centralized server into a separate layer. And here are a few examples. You know, projects such as Apache Camel and Spring Integration started in 2007 and then quickly adopted into, uh, towards the microservices. Uh, Redis for key value access, you know, Kafka for event-driven applications were created all, all after that. If you have used something uh, from Netflix OSS libraries such as Hist Hystrix for reliable synchronous interactions. You know, the uh, circus breaker pattern was, I think, first implemented there in Java. Kamunda, uh, Conductor, Cadence, these were all Java-based projects for uh, stateful orchestration of service interactions. Um, so th these projects basically represent for separation of uh, distributed system uh, primitives from the centralized layer into separate uh, libraries and standalone projects. But they still remained within the control of the developers and within the uh, control of the organization. So they are still self-managed within the, your data center or, or the cloud. Uh, you know, while I would say developers were this time busy, you know, arguing what's the right size for a microservice or how to strangle a monolith, there were a few things that happened at the infrastructure layer. Um, Docker was announced at 2013, which unlocked a huge wave of uh, innovation in the infrastructure abstraction, right? Kubernetes and Lambda were announced a year later, and a number of service mesh projects uh, followed after that. But all that meant that all of the runtime um, responsibilities I mentioned earlier, all of the networking responsibilities, they start shifting from the application down to the platform and, and not becoming any more a developer responsibility, but a platform responsibility. For example, uh, with uh, Docker and Kubernetes, now developer didn't have to care about, you know, packaging, placement, scaling, configuration of the application, or on the network resilience, you know, with the service mesh, you don't have to care within the application, anything around uh, securing resiliency and observability of the network interactions. So all of these features start sinking, uh, sinking down from the application layer down to the platform. Um, uh, moving forward, this uh, also shifted the boundary between the application and, and the platform using containers and Kubernetes and, uh, you know, similar polyglot abstractions uh, that meant that now developers and operations team, they can use the same uh, tooling, they can use the same language, and uh, we, which led basically to further adoption of practices such as, you know, DevOps uh, uh, and GitOps. Um, that's basically the way I see, you know, cloud native uh, technologies. And what, what about cloud bound? Uh, so to, to explain that, we have to look into um, see uh, what's cloud native, you know. So this is the cloud native uh, landscape defined by CNCF. And CNCF uh, today has the definition of what's cloud native, you know, it's one source. Uh, and if you look, if you look at the projects there, we will see that most of the CNCF projects, such as Kubernetes and everything else, is you know if you map those to different software development lifecycle, we will see that they are primarily geared towards ops. So they are mostly around building your container images, then provisioning, deploying that with various release strategies, then uh, scaling, operating that, uh, and observing. There are very few projects such as, you know, Dapper and a few other libraries that helps developers implement uh, distributed applications. So, so in my view, cloud native is today, the way it's implemented is mostly around running and operating applications rather than implementing. And, uh, but, but if we have, you know, an application, let's say it's in a container, there, uh, it first, it needs to run on top of some kind of, uh, 
compute infrastructure, right? So whether that's a container service or Kubernetes service or some kind of uh, function based on Lambda or Knative, it doesn't matter. And there are certain type of contracts, certain kind of contract between the application and the compute layer, the way the health checks are done, the way you define your uh, configuration, the way you request certain compute from the platform, these are all the compute bindings. And in my uh, view, cloud native scope is primarily centered around that. So how do I run an application? But an application also needs you know, other needs. For example, an application may need um, uh, to use some kind of messaging, eventing. So it may need to talk to an eventing store. It may need some kind of storage, whether that is database or some other key value store. It needs to talk with other services, etc. So these are all kind of interaction, which I call integration bindings. You know, at runtime, your application talks to these other services and binds with those. And here are a you know, few example uh, protocols and APIs you might use for that. You know, Kafka for pops up, Redis for key value store, uh, Amazon S3 is uh, uh, basically a de facto standard for accessing object stores. And, and Dapper, the, pro uh, the project we are working on, it's an example of a project that has APIs that encapsulates all of that. It has API for pops up, key value access, you know, uh, file access. Uh, Etc. So the way I define cloud bound is all of these other responsibilities that your application needs to bound to. And if, if we look at today, you know, at the various cloud services, we'll see that uh, you know lots of uh, compute services that your application binds to. In a way, uh, there are you know these compute services ranging from more coarse grained, you know, something like EC2 to container services to Lambda to edge functions, etc. Then there are lots of networking services from pure low level networking to things such as API gateways where you can write some scripts. There are uh, eventing, you know, messaging uh, services uh, from major clouds and uh, other providers, and there are stateful orchestration uh, services. You know, uh, the way I define is your application at runtime it can bind to one or more of these services when it's functioning. Uh, so, if you look at back to our framework with the different needs, uh, I would say, you know, when, when you're running your application today. Uh, we will see that most of these cloud services they start shifting from uh, coarse grained infrastructure into more application centric and developer centric services. For example, instead of using EC2, you can use the Kubernetes service. But instead of actually using a Kubernetes service, you can just use the container service, or you can use Lambda or something like AppRunners, which is geared to one uh, application. Uh, same with the networking side. You know, instead of using, let's say, uh, I'm giving examples from Amazon. Instead of using um, uh, Elastic Load Balancer, you can use Application Load Balancer, or even API Gateway that is at the uh, HTTP layer where it understands your uh, application routing. You know, instead of installing a Kafka on a cloud service, you can use something like Event Bridge, where you can also do some kind of uh, filtering, transformation, uh, etc. And similarly on the uh, stateful orchestration side. So there are lots of uh, services that can do stateful orchestration. Um, and basically what we see here is that it's not just the runtime is now uh, can be fully managed, but also the integration needs can be also fully managed. You can consume they, those um, uh, a, as a service. Um, so what does it mean for your application? I would say uh, the main thing you will be writing is probably the business logic, but for that business logic, in order to be you know portable and used across different uh, clouds, uh, in order for you to use different patterns, there are a few things you can do. The first one is maybe when you are identifying the boundaries, you know use some of the principles from domain-driven design, from microservices, from hexagonal architecture to find the right size of, for your service. Maybe that's a monolith, maybe that's microservice or something like a function. So once you've done that, second thing is uh, uh, wrap your application, package it in a format that is portable. Today, that's primarily containers, right? If you run it in a container, it doesn't matter whether it's a function or a microservice or something else that will be you know, easy to run local, easy to use with uh, lots of tools. Uh, or maybe you, you can use Kubernetes or uh, some uh, uh, function service, doesn't matter. You know, your runtime will emit metrics, logs, so use uh, open source standards such as open telemetry, log into JSON and things like that. And the third thing is on the integration side. So if you're using uh, de facto open source standards such as 
uh, Kafka and Redis and Dapper. If you wrap your event, uh, your data into cloud events, they will be easy to you know port around and uh, and connect to other services. And this is the uh, summary of the whole talk. So I, uh, the way I see is previously we had you know the application that would do everything itself. Uh, gradually that was eaten by uh, Kubernetes and similar compute-oriented uh, infrastructure, but today we see that also the other parts, the integration needs are being commoditized and eaten by the cloud services. So what's left for you is basically in the future is probably all you will do is write the business logic. And if you encapsulate that business logic with open standards, with uh, uh, open source projects, that will be portable. Uh, here I have a few links, so if you want to get a free copy, uh, check out the book website, check out Dapper projects, what we are working on, and the Diagrid website uh, we are hiring. Thank you.